All right, so here we are. It's 424. This class is nearly at the end. So today I'm going to do mobile app investigations and photographs. Next time, Mac Forensics, then Velociraptor, and that's it. Um, all right, so let's start with that, which is here. So uh, I was a little confused when I first saw this because I think of static and dynamic analysis in analyzing malware, but you can also use it to analyze apps. So when you install an app, or for that matter, any application, then you can do static analysis, which is analyzing the files created and stored on the system by the app when the app is not running. And dynamic analysis is where you run the app and measure like things like the network traffic and the memory usage of the app while it goes. So typically, um, uh, mobile apps have SQLite databases, just a form of a database they like to use. And it may or may not be encrypted, but this is where you'll find contacts, phone numbers, um, emails, and things like that. And so static analysis, you go into the folders. Here's a uh, iPhone directory. In, in, in iPhones, it's in the library directory. You'll find like Tinder, for example, a dating app here. Here's Tinder. And then there's Tinder2.sqlite. So when you go in there, you have a database. It'll be full of tables. And in the tables will be, you know, all the information stored by the app, like phone numbers and physical locations and such. Uh, Tinder in particular stores a lot of information about physical locations because one of the features, I think, is to find somebody near you so you can meet up. Uh, so on iOS, you find it in the libraries, and here they find... Uh, all right. Another thing you can do in static analysis is analyze the code. You can read the code of the app and see how it works. This is something you often do for malware and to find defects in apps and also to find vulnerabilities in apps to hack into them. So, for example, in Android, there's a um, Android manifest file, which is like the master directory to the file, and it lists um, all the permissions it has, among other things. So this, is, this thing has access to Bluetooth and the camera and the Internet and so on. Um, Dex to Jar is a useful tool we use in the mobile app hacking class. Um, it's a tool that will take the um, version of the app that is sort of compiled, partially compiled like Java is, and on your phone, and turn it back into readable JavaScript. Read uh, Java, not JavaScript, but Java. So you can, uh, the thing about Android apps is they can be, you pretty much can get clean source code from the app on the phone which is emphatically not true of things written in C and C++ and forth, but it is very much true of Java apps. Um, the final version of it is only partially compiled and it can be reversed like .NET, which we've been doing in the, uh, uh, the uh, I think, exploit development class. .NET is the same. The, the things you distribute are only partly compiled and you can reverse them right back into readable source code, which developers need to understand for security. Developers often imagine that their source code is secret and the compiled app can't be reversed easily, and that is more or less true of C, and it's very emphatically not true of Java and .NET. So dynamic analysis is where you run the app and see what it does, and one thing you might do is run Wireshark and watch the traffic go by. You can see what traffic it's sending where. And so here's date apps. Uh, Tinder allows data deep linking, apparently. You can connect Inside Tinder, apparently you can link to things that are outside Tinder, so you can watch where it goes. And so here's it going to like Amazon services and something at the MIT and something at another Amazon and something with just an autonomous system number. I don't know what it is. But anyway, they're, they're following the traffic, reaching out to other things outside Tinder from inside the Tinder app, which is an interesting and uh, risky thing to do because normally you would want to restrict it to only go to your company, and then if somebody tries to put malware in it and connect to a command and control server, they can't. Um, all right, so you can find out where the data is being stored. For example, if you can follow the network traffic, you can see where it's sending the data, and then you can decide what nation that's in, what state that's in, and then you can decide if you have jurisdiction to get a search warrant there or not. Because, of course, if it's sending it off to, out to another nation, then you probably have not much chance of getting legal rights to... Uh, to get at that data. So here's just a uh, log of all the IP addresses connected to from these various parts of Tinder going by. And if you look in the Tinder SQLite database, it shows you the number of people near you within a certain number of miles, and you can get more precise information about them. Uh, New York, US. All right, and Skype's SQLite database is here, and it's got, of course, all the information you might have about your Skype calls, like videos and SMSs and contacts and voicemails and so on. So, you know, this kind of thing you'll get in there. This, and this is what a tool like um, Autopsy does for you automatically. It digs through these things and finds things it can recognize and lays them out in an easy-to-read way. 
so you don't need to do it manually. All right, and so photos are extremely important. Um, it turns out in court, photographic evidence and videos are extremely valuable because it has a big emotional impact on the jury. And it's not complicated. You can see here's the photograph of them doing the bad thing. That you know everybody can see what that means, right? As opposed to like a page of like complicated numbers you're you're going to deduce that from. Um, so uh, the, uh, the top FBI priority for many years was uh, innocent images, uh, trying to deal something about exploited children for child porn. Now I think that's number two, and the first one is terrorism. At least it was last time I, I saw the list. But anyway, it's extremely important. And uh, child exploitation cases, cases is a big law enforcement priority, and they have the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And so they have a huge database of images of exploited children so that hopefully you can find out if somebody has those images, then they're guilty of possessing them. And they also analyze them to find out, like, the curtains and stuff in the background to find out where they are. Uh, this is also how they handle human trafficking, people that are tricked to come here from other nations and then uh, forced into prostitution. They put them in hotel rooms, and there's a whole society of people that help find those hotel rooms by just taking pictures of all the hotel rooms you go to to make a database you can spot from the curtains and the bedspreads and stuff which room they're in, and that has been used to help a lot of people. So it's Project Vic is uh, a, a huge database of child abuse hashes that's shared among law enforcement. And this is why you're hearing a lot of news again. This will be coming up for years. Uh, the, the law enforcement agencies try to convince cell phone manufacturers to automatically scan their images against this on everybody's phone. So it will just tell them if somebody's phone has child porn on it. And Apple said they were going to do that about a year ago. And then but there's a huge outcry from the privacy advocates. They didn't. But um, law enforcement would like to see that. Uh, the privacy advocates would like to not see that on the grounds that it's on my phone, it's nobody's business but mine. And of course, they have the one reason that they do that is that this thing will have some false positives. It will finger some innocent people. And now what do you do? And there are cases of that. There's a case of a guy that um, took a, his kid had a medical problem, so he took a picture of the kid naked and sent it to the doctor, and they prosecuted him for child porn. And you know, this kind of thing will happen. Um, That's right. That's another big, of course, Apple's big thing is Apple is very extreme about privacy. That's what they sell. I mean, I don't think Android cares, but iPhones, you're supposed to really keep things private. And so to them, it would also hurt their business. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, so here's Facebook selfie. Um, here's somebody um, that um, there was a belt found near her body, and then she took a selfie hours before the murder wearing that same belt. So uh, there's quite a few that found this way. Um, they, they'd see some article of clothing on somebody. I've seen it used for, like, bombers and stuff, too. Um, in CNN, they had a child predator took pictures of his acts with a child in the bathroom, and they were able to uh, identify a prescription medication bottle in one of them to get the first name and a couple letters, a digits of the prescription number, and, of course, that's going to be enough to find people. Um, there's extortion. This is a really big issue, a really big crime where you trick people, you sort of get some naked pictures of somebody and then you say, well, I'm going to send those to your parents unless you give me more. And you trick them, sort of extort them into doing more and more nasty things. Um, I've heard of much larger punishments than this, six, six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine for that. So anyway, digital photographs are stored as computer files and they can be stored in anywhere, any kind of media on any kind of device. Um, DCIM is a common directory you'll see in the root directory for digital cameras, they're usually in that directory. And uh, so social media websites and things like um, Instagram, of course, have huge amounts of photo images, and a lot of those can be involved in crimes and help to identify people. Facebook has a ton of these. There's a service that law enforcement agents subscribe to that is highly controversial called, I forget the name, Skyhook or something, that actually scanned like all the Facebook stuff for years without permission archived it all, made a database of all these faces, and they can facially identify people, and people argue that it's like unethical and perhaps illegal that they use the images that way. But many law enforcement agencies are in fact subscribing to it and using it because they say it really works. You can take a picture of somebody and you can find out their name just from their picture. So when they flicker Instagram, Snapchat, Snapchat in particular claimed that your images would vanish. And I remember all the security people getting mad in hell. They say, what do you mean it vanishes? I could just catch a screenshot. I could just take a camera. You can't guarantee it's going to vanish. All you can say is it's, it's generally probably not going to persist. But it turns out that um, 
in fact, images are still often present on the, de the device after uploading. It doesn't even, in fact, delete as much as it could delete of them. All right, EXIF is a metadata of usually in, in digital images, and EXIF typically stores extra data along with the picture, like the GPS location, the type of camera, the owner's registered name, perhaps, the, uh, you know, things like that. So that's often been used to catch people who didn't know that data was in there. Of course, that data can be manipulated. It could be faked. It can be erased and it can be faked. So it's not absolute proof. All right, so raster graphic is a grid of pixels and you can store that kind of image. That's what a bitmap is, just a list of the color of all the pixels. But that turns out to be a really big file. And so you typically compress it. And so these other um, types like JPEG and BMP and PNG and GIF and TIFF are all compressed files. Some of them are lossless compression, like PNG, and some of them are lossy compression. JPEG compresses the file in a way that actually loses data, but they tried to carefully remove the data that is beyond the human capacity to see. So the image will continue to look good and get smaller, as small as possible. Um, JPEG is one of the most popular um, formats for images on the web for that reason because it's typically got the smallest file and still looks pretty good. Um, but ping is lossless and uh, all right. The most common ones I see now are JPEG and ping. Um, but there's GIF as well. And there's a huge argument of whether this should be GIF or GIF. So people get all excited about that. <laughs> anyway, um, it does stand for graphics interchange format. So if you want to be like that, it would seem like GIF would be more logical. But anyway, all right. I do not know. I know GIF has been around for a very long time. CompuServe made it like 30, 40 years ago. Oh, you mean just saying it, GIF? Yeah. Oh, it could be, yes. Anyway, um, so. Also, there are thumbnails. This is the thing to know about Windows systems, and I think also Macs. If you view a list, a folder, you can get little small images, in them, and those are thumbnails. The system automatically generates shrunken images of files, and those often persist even when files are deleted. So getting the thumbnails is something you often do with forensic images. You may not get the full-size image, but you might find the thumbnail, and you can see some detail in there. And then there's vector graphics. Vector graphics are not a list of pixels at a certain resolution, they are a mathematical representation of something. So if you have something simple like a logo, something made out of circles and triangles, you can make a vector version of it, and then you can zoom in as much as you want, and it will always never get blurry. It will automatically render at maximum resolution on every device, and the file is often much smaller because it doesn't list every pixel. It lists, draw a circle here, draw a line between these points, draw a polygon over here, and it's just a list of numbers that can be used. So. Um, scalar vector graphics, scalable vector graphics are a common one, but there's others. Vector graphics are very nice, very high quality, but they do not have the uh, detail of like a, a realistic photograph. They're typically for like cartoons and logos and simple things like that. So the original document rule applies to photographs. You should bring an original, but you can also have a duplicate if it's uh, deemed a genuine copy. Um, all right. And uh, Digital photos, you can do a lot of things to improve them. You can de-blur them, you can enhance the color, you can crop them and all that jazz. For example, here's one. A criminal posted this thing thinking he had hidden his identity in the picture, but this is like a Photoshop thing where he's taken the images and swirled them around like two or three turns, and so you can undo that, and they did undo that, and make it recognizable, and then they could arrest him. I mean, this is just a mathematical transformation, and you can just, you know, figure it out. Um, all right. And this is true, there's a whole lot of redacted documents where people did foolish things to try to remove the forbidden information that weren't good enough, and the so-called redacted documents, people are able to reconstruct the parts that were supposed to be removed. That happens quite a lot. What will they do about real-looking AI images, DJ? Well, it's a big issue, although to be fair, we've had trick photography for years. You can use darkroom tricks, and we had Photoshop for decades, and you can use Photoshop to make, to replace one face with another in an image and all that, so, um, I'm not sure that the deep fakes really make it any different than it was before, but they will mean, now you, the main thing about deep fakes, I think, is you can make videos with voice that say, that are completely fake, where it looks like a celebrity is saying something and they never said that, but it sounds good and it looks good. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't heard of any cases where people actually been prosecuted with those fake images, but it seems like it's inevitable, it's gonna happen. I haven't even heard of like a political scandal where they faked a video and 
and got somebody to lose an election because they made a fake video of them saying something terrible. But it seems like that would also happen. But I don't. It hasn't happened yet. All right, let's try a Kahoot, which is here. All right. Oh, I think my not getting the whole screen here in the stream. All right. Anyway. There's the number, 914-7425. Yeah, no, I couldn't see it either. Something about the background color makes it harder to see than usual. All right, so a technology used to store data in mobile apps. SQLite, simple form of SQL, stores your data in a single file. So what organization includes private and law enforcement partners? All right, Project Vic, which I think is that repository of images of child sex abuse. All right, so which company made claims that images would vanish quickly that were not really true? That's Snapchat. By the way, I think WhatsApp is now offering this for instant messages. After the explosive revelations of all the text messages at Fox News, I think that made people think, you know, I would probably like to send messages that will vanish after a day or something. <laughs> all right, which one of these is the lossy format? JPEGs. All right. I don't know who D is. They'll have to tell me if they want their points. Billy. I think we know who Billy is. Jake. Looks like the real name too. Good. All right. So at least two of you, I think, will be able to find you if you give you points. By the way, is anybody here named Sid? There's a person who won the Kahoot several times using the name Sid, and we were unable to figure out who you are. So I'm trying to remember to ask questions in class, so hopefully we can find out who it is that gets those points. Anyway, all right, well, that's it for the lecture part. Let me stop this recording.